Good morning, uh, everyone. Good morning if you're in Canada, good afternoon if you're in Europe. Uh, my name is Diana Fox Carney, and I'm delighted to be the host of today's session, uh, the second in our Building Back Better Canada and Europe uh, series. So uh, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna have a really full discussion. So without wasting further time, I'm gonna pass you over to Toby Heaps from Corporate Knights uh, to give us a little bit of a background intro. Thank you, Toby. Thanks, Diana. It's a pleasure to host the second series with our colleagues at the German Embassy in Canada. We have a, an all-star cast here of people who um, really understand how to get the money flowing, uh, which is the topic of today's discussion. So I'm, I'm really um, happy to welcome Jane M. Baxter, who's one of Canada's great sustainable finance exports, uh, presently running sustainable investing for BNP Asset Management over in Paris. We also have with us Sabrina Schultz, uh, Sabrina has been at the center of one of the most influential public investment banks um, in Europe, moving and helping to create programs that move billions of dollars, including into things like mass retrofit uh, programs for, for buildings. Henner, uh, who is with us uh, uh, from the Central Bank in Germany, uh, he also plays a role in helping to chair the network for greening the financial system. It's a group of central bankers, one of the most powerful and influential and uh, solutions oriented groups in, in the, the global financial space. And uh, we also have with us um, John Casola, of course, uh, who's the chief investment officer um, and uh, was at the center of attention, attention in recent weeks when the plans to uh, mobilize $10 billion into the green recovery through the Can Canadian Infrastructure Bank were announced. And of course, uh, last but not least, um, our, the erstwhile Sean Kidney, um, who heads up the Climate Bonds Initiative and has not single-handedly, but has been certainly the most influential figure um, to help to make the green bond space into a, a trillion dollar marketplace. So we have a great, great cast of um, uh, colleagues to, to really help explain how we get the money flowing. So we're going to look at, you know, where does the money come from? Because uh, we, we, we're going to need to get a lot of money from the public and, and the private sector to make this happen. What will best catalyze investment in clean industry? Um, you know, there's some thought around grants, uh, one-time grants versus uh, permanent tax breaks, uh, which is more fiscally sustainable. Also, how do we get the money flowing into the big area, the mass retrofits uh, of the residential buildings in particular? Um, is it uh, cheap loans or is it grants um, or is it uh, one and then the other? In terms of uh, how much money we need to mobilize, we've done a little work with our colleagues uh, earlier in the summer, uh, Ralph Torrey and Celine Back, looking at what the capital requirements would be to uh, do a green recovery in a serious way over the next decade. And if we just pull up the, the first slide, you can see we're talking about uh, a lot of a lot of funds. Overall, um, the blue piece is the federal government component and the, the, the orange piece is the other sector, mostly private sector money. So you can see two things here. One is there's a ratio of about $1 for federal government money to seven for other sectors. So we really need to, we can't do this all with the federal government. We need to figure out how to crowd in at least $7 for every $1 the federal government's putting in. The other thing you see here is about 40% of the federal government component is at the front end. That's to, um, to help the un unclog blockages, create economies of scale and align different um, regulations so that we can sustain the momentum going forward. If we look at the next slide, there is a little bit of a better breakdown by some of the major uh, segments that will be having the capital plan roll out over the next decade. At the top, you can see the greening home and the greening workplaces are by far the sort of biggest component by dollars. And again, at the front end, you have a lot of the money. Most of the most of the money in the residential side has to um, probably be free money for the first couple of years to get those economies of scale and the modularization and the cost down so that we can really um, open up the opportunities for deep retrofits for more efficient buildings going forward. When you look at the bottom left-hand corner, you see the greening power sector. And really, there's a big role there to create some of the essential infrastructure to lay down the huge renewables that um, uh, will be replacing the, the remainder of the fossil fuel generation in Canada. And that's gonna require transmission lines between provinces and massive uh, energy storage, including pumped hydro storage. And so that's where the, the federal money, big role there for the Canadian Infrastructure Bank. In terms of the EV uptake, a lot of that is uh, charging infrastructure and also cash for carbon clunkers at the front end. And then the economics take over in, in the mid decade and um, the range anxiety goes away and it's just, just makes more sense for people to buy electric cars. So the whole, the private market takes over. And then with the um, crowding in the clean industry, that's really kind of key because that's going to be the mojo that's going to 
drive the economy. You can see that that's more of a sustained public role. There's an R&D role more pronounced at the front end, especially on the uh, natural resource side. And then there's a deployment uh, piece that we saw um, roll out with the, the Ford electric uh, vehicle plant that was announced with uh, the federal and provincial governments kicking in uh, a little over a quarter of the money. So that's, um, that's what we're looking at. We need about $700 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, the federal government um, ambitiously could step up for $100 billion. We need to figure out how to get the rest of the money flowing. And uh, with that, uh, back to you, Diana. Thank you so much, Toby, for outlining the scale of our challenge. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Ambassador Sabina Sparwasser from uh, Germany. We're delighted to be uh, that you are sponsoring this series uh, and thinking about the lessons that can be learned between Germany and Canada. Thank you so much and thank you to Corporate Knights for picking up once again a subject of the utmost um, relevance. Know that reaching the climate targets, the Paris climate targets, zero net emission by 2050, at the same time as we need to build better after COVID, is going to ask for unprecedented investment. Toby now just spoke about Canada. The EU also has put a number on this. Its stimulus package is a staggering 1.8 trillion euros. That has, is a number with 18 zeros. And the national governments in Canada and France and uh, Germany uh, are also committing historic sums for the transition to a sustainable economy. And as Toby said, public money is important. It's needed as leverage, but it's nowhere near enough. So we need to significantly raise private capital for the transition. And green bonds and loans are one of the upcoming solutions and tools to answer that question. Now, talking about the EU again a little bit, um, uh, the EU Commission has now announced a finance strategy that attracts and directs investments to support a resilient economy, and that means green bonds, and they're growing very fast, I think 200 uh, billion uh, uh, for the uh, recovery package alone will be in green bonds. And I'm really glad that um, big German companies like BASF and Porsche are really heavily investing into that. The EU is also, and that's a different issue, but an important one too, very clear on the need for standards for green financing. So what qualifies as green? and has come up with a beautiful word, the EU taxonomy, which is a classification system that looks at six environmental objectives, establishes a do no harm principle and the need for transparency. Now, these are all good steps and they need to be adapted by other jurisdictions as well. What we're looking at is probably the financial challenge of our lifetime. It's our once in a lifetime in a generation opportunity to build better. And each of the institutions um, uh, that today's panels, uh, represent, uh, panels participants represent has a very significant role in building that better future and green recovery. So tell us about a future that's bright. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. And you really uh, got to the heart of the issues that we're discussing today. So let's move now. Uh, I'm going to invite, first of all, Sean Kidney, who, as Toby mentioned, is the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative. Sean, can you explain, give us a little bit more detail on the uh, European Commission's action plan on sustainable finance and explain that taxonomy, which is, as, uh, as the ambassador said, a, a curious name for a very important uh, way of classifying investment. And how, why is that important and what relevance might it have to the rest of the world as well? Thank you. The taxonomy is simply a shopping list for the future, a procurement plan for the Paris Agreement. That's all it is. Nothing more complicated than that. Now, it seems astounding that after 30 years of listening to scientists telling us what we've got to do, it's taken us this long to do this, but it has. We have in the past been caught up in discussions about the political economy of what we want to do and the challenge between this is what the science says, and well, this is what I think we can do, it's all very difficult, et cetera, et cetera. The problem is that's got us to a position where according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, we now have to get emissions down 55% on average globally by 2030 to be able to have even a half decent chance of creating a future for our children. And we're in a very severe kind of position. The triumph of the European taxonomy 
is that it is science-based. It does not start with constraints. It starts with the science and says, this is what we have to do. This is the shopping list. And then it says, let's go away and look at how to get there, which is why in Europe you've now seen a green hydrogen strategy by Germany being delivered post-taxonomy. It is clear green hydrogen is a critical turnkey solution, for example. So that's really what it is. You know, we've got a big challenge. Emissions down very, very quickly. Ursula von der Leyen, in a speech a couple of weeks ago, committed Europe to 55% cuts on 90, 90 levels by 2030, as every country in the world, including Canada, needs to do according to the IPCC. So let's be clear about that. That's one. But now we have to figure out what that's involved. We know we've got the capital. I mean, extraordinarily at the moment, we have more capital on the planet than ever before in history. Huge slabs of it, of course, the pockets of Jane Abbott, she's going to talk a little bit later. 21% of institutional investment capital in Europe is currently in negative or zero interest rate bonds or bonds. This is no way to pay my pension when I finally retire. We need to put that capital to work. And luckily, the capital wants to work. If I can get the first slide. Um, what we've got recently is proof of concept. So as we have started creating a green bond market, currently a trillion dollar market globally, investors have piled into this because we've created a product that meets their risk and yield requirements and also addresses climate change. These are material investments to climate change. So now we have much higher subscription levels. Henna will talk about the German Green Bund in a little while. Incredibly exciting development of the market. But corporate bonds, bank bonds are getting a price benefit. They are getting further investors. And in the stock price world for corporates, they're getting a stock price bounce and it stays up there because they're willing to do green. Now, why is this happening? It's because investors are convinced the future will change. There is no doubt now amongst any institutional investor we speak to, the climate change action is are happening and is coming. The question is, who are the winners and who are the losers? The taxonomy gives you a universe, a shopping list of the future, where you can be pretty sure that universe will not be impacted by policy changes going forward. It is lower risk. That's why people are investing in it. It is a lower risk universe than everything else. You can't be sure that the other stuff isn't going to be blindsided by some kind of policy change coming through in China, in Europe, in Canada, and in the US when eventually the government changes. So that's what we're looking at, and that's what we've done with the taxonomy. In Europe, one last thing. We've really made this taxonomy the centerpiece of our action plan on sustainable finance. It also informs the disclosure arrangement, the implementation of the task force on climate-related climate financial disclosure, TCFT, involves in Europe also requiring investors, corporations, and banks to disclose their sustainable investments. And if they're gonna have a sustainable product, a sustainable fund or an index, Toby does some of these, they have to use the taxonomy as a reference to describe what is sustainable. Finally, we have a common language. We have never before had a common language. And that common language is rooted in a procurement plan for the Paris Agreement. This diner is revolutionary. And it's proving revolutionary as countries around the world start developing their own taxonomy. South Africa, Malaysia, Chile, Colombia, and a little group in Canada called the Canadian Standards Authority is working on a Canadian taxonomy as well. That's something we'll pick up later. Oh, sorry, I just need to show you one more slide before I go, quickly. This is the Canadian story. It's not true that nothing's happened. We've seen 32 billion issued already since 2013. Eight billion this year already. And there's a huge wad coming through in the last few months of the year. Nine and a half billion last year. And look at all the issuers. We've seen government, we've seen private, etc. So this has got going in Canada, but it hasn't got going anywhere near enough. To be able to do what Toby tells us we need to do, we have to do a lot, lot more. We have to disclose our investments in equity, green loans, and we need to go to the green bond market. So a lot of work to be done, guys. Thank you so much, Sean. Uh, and great to know that we are in a good position to start, but as you say, uh, it's a shame we didn't get started a bit, a, bit uh, a few years ago. I'd like now to move to Hannah Asher, um, the Deputy Director General of Markets at the Bundesbank. 
Um, and the Bundesbank is a steering group member of the Network for Greening the Financial System, which is uh, the central banks and supervisors network. Uh, and they're thinking about how at a, at a high level, uh, the system can be uh, become more sustainable. So Henna, could you explain a little bit what the NGFS is doing uh, right now and also elaborate on what role you think central banks can play in ensuring that we get more finance flowing to the right things. Thank you very much, Diana. Yes, it's, it's my pleasure. As you already mentioned, the NGFS is a network of central banks and supervisors, and it's covering now all continents on almost all major economies. You know, there's one exception. And it was in late 2017 when we celebrated the second anniversary of the, climate, of the Paris Climate uh, Agreement that we were thinking, okay, what can we do as central banks and supervisors? Uh, and uh, we said, okay, let's start. And we started with eight jurisdictions in this network, and uh, we are one of the founding members. But at present, the NGFS comprises more than 70 central banks, seven zero, and supervisors from all over the world. And I guess this is really a good testimony of the important role climate change plays uh, for financial sector, in the financial sector, and for central banks. And the, the Bank of Canada as well is also a very, very active member in this network. Uh, okay, if we are to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, the financial sector is of course uh, one of the drivers of the necessary transformation, transformation of the real economy, that goes without saying. But at the same time, the financial system itself is tremendously exposed to physical and transition risk in the context of climate change. And this is true, particular if we do not act early enough. And uh, a well-functioning uh, financial system is both a requirement for our monetary policy to work effectively, and it is also at our heart of responsibilities as banking supervisors and guardians of financial stability. And it is thus uh, really self-evident that central banks and supervisors need to monitor and analyze how the financial sector responds to this climate change uh, challenges. But of course, at the same time, central banks and supervisors have to analyze the implications climate change have for our own business, for our own mandates as central banks. And the NGFS is the coalition of the willing prepared to do just that. It is a voluntary consensus-based forum. We work together to exchange experience, share best practices, but also to develop common approaches. And I guess this is essential. We are organized in three work streams. The NGF members deal with microprudential supervision. This work stream is, uh, has been chaired by China, is now chaired by Singapore. We have, we deal with macro financial impacts for stress testing, climate stress testing, setting scenarios and things like that. This chair is very successfully chaired by the Bank of England. And then there's a third work stream, which is so to say set up to scale up green finance. And this is the one that is chaired uh, by the, the Bundesbank. And, uh, how can we sort of say scale up green finance as a central bank? Uh, this is really uh, the question we try to answer and find answers. First of all, we have to ask what we can do with our own non-monetary policy uh, portfolios, with our money we are investing. And here we have set up surveys on sustainable and responsible investment, investing of central banks. And here we can lead by example how we can manage it and thereby also, of course, protecting our own balance sheet. The second is uh, we are working on market dynamics. We are looking at the data we have uh, in, in this uh, issue and the data we still do need. And we have to fill these data gaps. And here we also see a, a responsibility of the central banks. And the third one is when it comes to scaling up green findings, what, how is the link to monetary policy? This is, so to say, our main task. And, and this leads me, so to say, to the second part of your question on the specific role that central banks can play to ensure that we can raise at least uh, sufficient financing uh, for the transition to net zero. Uh, 
What we have already achieved so far is raise a lot of awareness in the financial system uh, for the extent um, of climate related financial risk because climate risk of uh, financial risk. And if you look at the figures just shown by, by Sean, we see this increasing diverse volume and, and diversity in the green financial markets segment. You can already say, I was called green goes rainbow. And this is also something uh, which is quite important to stress. But looking ahead, what financial market participants need are more precise instruments to measure the climate related risk and to manage these uh, financial, uh, these climate related risks on their portfolios. And that's what we are doing with our own portfolios for the time being already. How can we, so to say, lead by example? And at present, we also know that there is still, still a lot of market uncertainty because of the lack of adequate and standardized granular data, especially. For example, when it comes to carbon footprints on an, yes, uh, let's say individual company level. And therefore improving the database is key to reduce and maybe at the end to remove the uncertainties to further broaden the investor base. And the broader database will then help uh, financial markets to manage sustainability risk more adequately and then allocate the capital effectively. And it will help that the climate risks are no longer, let's say, mispriced uh, in the markets. So in this regard, central banks uh, should certainly act as catalysts. So we could link, for example, the eligibility of assets for monetary policy operations to the disclosure of climate related information. That would, I guess, would be a great incentive to, to bring, to come about with this, uh, to come, uh, with this information. And to this end, we could maybe follow a stepwise approach. We could start with the criteria for the collaterals. And in fact, we already started. So for, as for, I guess, yes, next year, the Euro system will start accepting sustainability linked bonds as eligible collateral. So that is the first time that the euro system accepts conditionalized bonds. And, uh, and once we have then these greener conditions for accepting a collateral, we will have refinancing operations that are more green by definitions as they are, would be backed by relatively more green assets. Uh, Moreover, we could also consider making the disclosure of climate related information mandatory for assets to be part uh, of these eligible universe in our purchase programs. That would be another idea. And uh, of course, the Euro system is already buying green bonds and, and what we find in the market, what is green, but it's not so to say given any privilege to this. And having said that, to give just some ideas what central banks can do with uh, regard to monetary policy, but let me be crystal clear here. Climate change is first and foremost uh, for elected policymakers to deal with and monetary policy has at the end no role in, in structuring this fight against climate change as it has no role in industrial policy or uh, distribution policy. Nevertheless, with, within our mandate, we want to lead by example and do whatever we can to support the efforts against global warming. We, that's why we have to consider how best to protect balance sheets and how to promote uh, disclosure and transparency in the market. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. I think you've given a very good uh, overview of, of the different roles you play as central banks and as network of central banks, both leading by example and potentially using the, this, this issue you discussed about using, uh, being able to change the nature of the collateral requirements, for example, to encourage uh, the move to green, greener activities. I'm going to now turn to, to Jane. Uh, Jane, we've uh, mentioned a couple of times the TCFD thus far. You were an early member um, of the TCFD task force. Perhaps you can give us just a little bit more background on what that requires of companies. It is a voluntary standard in most places now, becoming 
mandatory, for example, in New Zealand, but it is uh, 1,500, I believe, 1,500 companies are reporting against the TCFD standards now across 60 countries. So it is becoming quite broad. So if you could just give a little background on that, but also talk about your own role as a private sector asset manager and how this is influencing your behavior. Thanks, Diana. Well, I think TCFD um, has played an incredibly important role in, in both bringing awareness to climate related risks and opportunities, but also really legitimizing, I think, the, um, the necessity and the urgency for companies and investors to not just think about it, but act on it uh, from the very top, from the, you know, from governance down through strategy and risk, and then the nitty gritty, right, the metrics and the reporting. So I would say it's, it's not a silver bullet, uh, necessarily, it depends, you know, how you use the framework, how thought, how thoughtful you are, and then what you go ahead and disclose, but it certainly has had a fantastic in, input uh, and impact in terms of really driving awareness. And it's great to see so many countries and regions continuing to, to kind of reference and use the TCFD to help to really embed the requirement around disclosure. And in fact, it's interesting now, we're part of a new initiative around uh, TNFD, which is the, the forthcoming task force on nature related financial disclosures. And of course, there's also so much urgency around uh, biodiversity loss, ecosystem challenges, which of course are so closely linked with, with climate. In terms of how we're behaving and, and thinking about sustainability as an asset manager at, at BNP Paribas Asset Management, I mean, we're investing across countries, um, markets, different kinds of assets. And we really think about sustainability in two ways. One, the more information that we can have and share with our portfolio managers, the better we equip them to make good investment decisions for our clients. Uh, and that directly links to uh, Henry's comments around data and quality of data and information and data accuracy. Um, but, but over the longer term and the mid and longer term, I think as well using our influence and our investments to push towards more, more capital market stability by addressing things like environmental challenges and climate, we can help to safeguard those long-term returns for clients. So for us, it's really that kind of dual pronged strategy. In terms of how we implement that, we have uh, six different elements of our sustainable investing approach. I'll go through them really quickly. The first is around ESG integration. So getting high quality data and information, sharing it with investment teams. We cover 12,000 entities globally. So it's hard to get good data uh, on just on carbon. You know, more than half of the data that we, we buy is estimated by other people. There are, you know, a lot of different variations, a lot of inaccuracies. So we spend a lot of time trying to improve that data. And I mean, that's just to talk about carbon. There's so many different areas that we all need to kind of work on from a data perspective. But we use um, both sector relative and absolute emissions as one of the elements to kind of score companies on how, how well they're doing, as well as a number of kind of forward looking metrics. So ESG integration is a big thing. And we measure and report on how we're doing both on ESG integration, but also carbon footprint of a fund versus its benchmark with an objective to beat the benchmark on carbon, regardless of the strategy. So I think that's relatively unique. The second area is around stewardship, uh, voting, proxy voting. We, uh, we won't support financial reports and accounts where a company is not reporting on carbon emissions. Uh, so that's also a way that we kind of bring uh, climate into our stewardship activities. We also were a lead filer this year on four shareholder resolutions addressing climate related lobbying and we're pleased to have majority support for our resolution at Chevron. We do a lot of company engagement. We're active through Climate Action 100 plus, for example. And we also spend a lot of time on public policy engagement and working with policymakers in Europe uh, through TCFD, but also in, in other markets to really push towards areas like uh, pricing externalities. So that's the stewardship focus. The third is around responsible business conduct expectations. So a big climate related piece here is around our coal policy, uh, in particular around the power sector. We're looking to invest in companies that are aligned with the International Energy Agency's um, kind of two degree line pathway for the power sector. So really looking at the carbon intensity of power generated. Our fourth area is around uh, really, you know, financing green, what we call our sustainable plus range. About 15% of our assets are in thematic funds or funds that are tilted towards kind of more green or less brown above and beyond what we're doing across all of our different strategies that I've just talked about. Uh, so, for example, we've launched the first circular economy ETF 
Um, we've just launched a new uh, blue economy fund. So really looking at different thematic opportunities. We have Earth, which is um, an environmental absolute return fund, looking not just uh, at investing in the companies that are supporting the transition, but shorting the companies that are not going to be successful in the transition. So really looking at those different thematic opportunities. The fifth element uh, is around um, our focus on the future. So three strategic areas that drive our research, our stewardship, our engagement, three E's, the energy transition, environmental sustainability, and equality and inclusive growth. So that's really an overarching strategy. And then finally, I think a really important piece that I, I hear less about in the asset management world is really on walking the talk. So we have a very strong uh, focus internally on making sure that we're embracing and adopting the different you know, areas we're kind of advocating with the companies that we're investing in. So we've got a zero waste goal for our headquarters. We're focused on internal uh, diversity targets, um, engaging with um, disadvantaged youth in the communities where, where we operate. So a number of different elements to really kind of bring it home for our staff, not just in how they invest, but also kind of life at work. Thank you, Jane. I want to come back to you later on just to discuss the difference between Europe and Canada, since you have both perspectives. But now I'm going to move on to Sabrina Schultz, who's a policy fellow at Desk Progressive Centrum in Berlin and has been running the Berlin office of KFW, which many of you will know is the German National Promotional International Development Bank. And as such, you're, you are investors um, in uh, the transition. Sabrina, can you tell us uh, about your, the, the KFW's role in, particularly in the COVID response, and perhaps how that is linking up with the green agenda in Germany? Thanks very much. I'm happy to do so. So a lot, have been, a lot has been said on uh, the sustainable finance agenda. And let me now briefly tell you the story about recovery programs in Germany and Europe. And this is largely a story about public funding so far. It's almost interesting to see that uh, miraculously, the measures taken largely follow the example of the New Deal in the US in the 1930s. In so far as there are clearly three phases, there's the relief, the recovery and the reform phase. And unsurprisingly, it's largely the reform bit um, that we still need to work on. When it comes to funding, Germany and the EU have to be seen as complementary efforts, although they are not necessarily coordinated so far. To start with the relief part, the German government very early on in the crisis agreed a 600 billion economic stabilization fund, uh, which is open to all companies in need. These first response measures are not tied to any climate or other sustainability criteria or conditionalities, and it all comes in terms of uh, loans. So the German vehicle of choice for handing out first response measures in form of loans is KFW. Um, it's just been explained. Uh, KFW is a public bank. It's uh, nevertheless fully regulated. It also plays an important role in uh, the German and European sustainable finance agenda, including in the green bonds uh, discussion, the taxonomy and so on. Now, because KFW is state owned, it has a triple A rating and can therefore refinance itself at negative interest rates um, on global financial markets. And it can also pass on these advantages to clients. KFW simultaneously is not a normal bank um, because it doesn't deal directly with clients. It works through intermediaries, i.e. commercial banks in order to not to distort uh, markets. Um, working through commercial banks is sometimes tricky because they decide on who gets a loan and who doesn't. It's not uh, the government. Now, briefly on the recovery part. In June, the German government was the first EU country to present a recovery package, mobilizing 130 billion euros. It will also be matched by EU recovery funding in the region of um, 47 billion euros. Again, there is not necessarily any alignment of this funding with climate-related governance, but approximately 30% of Germany's recovery package will have a positive effect on climate if the money is spent. Measures comprise things like uh, a temporary cut of the VAT rate for the second half of this year, but also um, things that are more important for the green agenda, such as significant support for hydrogen projects uh, that comes um, uh, with uh, 9 billion euros, 
and there are also a number of measures to support the autom the uh, automotive industry so it uh, can manage a transition much easier so there's for instance uh, support for electric vehicle infrastructure so as i said german and eu efforts are complementary so quickly a few words about the eu part of the story in june it was decided that the eu will borrow for the first time in history to set up a range of comprehensive aid funds um, again, the, the first response measure, uh, the total of loans and grants is 750 billion euros. It's absolutely crucial for these measures, uh, for the measures financed in this context to focus on reform, which was the third part of the US Green Deal at the time. And the very obvious vehicle for this at the EU level is the European Green Deal. It was published in December last year. It's dubbed Europe's Man on the Moon Moment. And the Green Deal is a collection of a lot of measures. So let me just mention a few. There's a European climate law to make sure that the EU will be climate neutral by the year 2050. Um, there is a 2030 climate target plan to make sure that the EU cuts its emissions by at least 55% by the year 2030. There is climate earmarking of 30% across all measures, and that's for the next seven years. Um, the EU plans to turn the European Investment Bank, the EIB, into a climate bank. So by 2025, 50% of its operations will be dedicated to climate action and environmental sustainability. Um, very important as well, there is the Just Transition Fund. Um, this uh, comprises funds of uh, 100 billion euros and they're earmarked for a just transition because the energy transition, as the Green Deal um, puts it, must put people first and pay attention to the regions, industries and workers who will face the greatest challenges. Now, all of this still needs to be translated into laws and regulations, and this will still be an uphill struggle. Um, the mantra, I guess, should be something like building forward better together. And if I may add a personal note, it's absolutely essential for the recovery to happen within our planetary boundaries. And it also needs to be characterized by European and international solidarity. Thank you so much, Sabrina. There's a, obviously a huge amount going on in Germany and a huge amount that we can learn uh, in Canada, which is where we're going to go now to, uh, to John Casola from the Canada Infrastructure Bank. John, it would be interesting to hear the sim some of the similarities and the differences between what you do, what the KFW does, but also to hear about your this new money that you that was announced a while back, 10 billion in funding for you to dedicate to certain sectors, how you're going to deploy that, how you choose how you deploy it, and how you're going to manage to crowd in other funders. Uh, as we've heard, it, this has to be a seven to one ratio between public and private money. So how will that help finance this whole package that Toby described at the beginning. Thank you, Diana, and thanks for uh, inviting me to this very important conversation. I was uh, listening to the other uh, very impressive speakers and chuckling a little bit because in almost every other context I can think of, $10 billion is a whole lot of money. In the context we're discussing, I find myself the poor man on the panel. So I suspect the best way to answer your question is I just, I just want to set a bit of context because many of the people participating today may not know much about the Canada Infrastructure Bank. And so let me just set the contacts by making three main points very quickly. First and most importantly, the premise of the bank is fundamentally that governments alone can't solve this problem. And frankly, neither can the private sector alone solve this problem. Um, we can see the slides that indicate the amount of government, uh, uh, government support and then private sector support. I think where we are focused is on that sweet spot, that, that area where uh, there are good and value-added sustainable projects to be had that simply can't make it to market because we can raise all the money that we want. We can raise all the bonds that we want. We can have all of the programs that we want. If we don't structure, if we can't structure deals that provide a return that is expected to all of these investors, we're nowhere. And, and so our focus is to try and be very, very pragmatic and deliver a program that we think is a, a very good start and that we can deliver in the foreseeable future. So again, governments can't do it alone. Uh, secondly, we're just one tool to address the challenge. 
And, and we specifically are seeking to avoid trying to be all things to all people. We are a tool. And so some of the rules around where we uh, play is we are investors in revenue generating infrastructure that is in the public interest. Very important, we don't do grants. We are prohibited from doing grants, in fact. So we are investors that can play anywhere in the capital structure. We have lots of flexibility to do equity, senior debt, sub debt, or any combination thereof. That's key. We need to structure deals so that we at least get our return of capital. We can be low cost capital and we can be very patient capital. All very important to enabling a lot of these projects that will then crowd in more private capital. And which leads me to my last, and oh, by the way, those are in the, in the very, uh, uh, there's four main sectors, public transit, trade and transportation, what we call green infrastructure and broadband. Those are the broad sectors that are approved for us to uh, be active in. And last, and very importantly, we cannot do a deal where we don't have private sector capital also in that deal. So that's a really important uh, a theme and imperative for us. And so one of the things we've been doing in, in coming up with ways to try and meet that requirement, that very important requirement, is we're trying to be as flexible as we possibly can. And we're trying to be a bit creative because I think that when the bank was created, the old way of doing it would say, well, we need some kind of a multi looking at it was we need some kind of a multiplier. And so, you know, we pick a number. There was no stated multiplier. There are all sorts of, of, of theories around what would be a better number than another a number. But at, at financial close, we'd put in, you know, a uh, dollar. And for every dollar that we put in, it'd be $2, $3, whatever the number is of private capital. It's interesting that, you know, life isn't that simple. And a lot of these deals aren't that simple. And so what we have done recently and coming up, especially with these new initiatives is we've taken a broad and we think a bit of an innovative view on what crowding in private capital means. And, and so we've expanded that to say we, in the interest of expedience, you know, in the current climate, we all find ourselves in uh, job creation um, because there are certain risks that find that private sector investors simply will not take we're willing to bridge that gap and we're willing to take it all at close. And then once we prove out that market, we will invite private capital in later. Once we in effect de-risk that proposition, we'll, we'll, we'll do that later. So, so it's a simply a timing issue, but it's an incredible what a difference that timing issue and that distinction makes. And a good example of that is our building retrofits program. And in fact, our, our zero emission buses program, where we think that the premise of both of those programs is really to use the uh, massive operational savings as a result of those asset classes by going electric, by, uh, by updating your retrofits, which is a, is, a, is a source to repay our debt, any private sector capital in the deal. And so that's the good news. The bad news is there aren't a lot of lenders out there without an operating history who are gonna take that risk right up front. So we can, we can plug that gap. We can fill that gap with patient capital, take that risk, let those things materialize, those savings materialize. And once there's a steady stream of data, we can sell down that debt, we can get out of the deal, bring in private capital, and then reuse our capital to build more infrastructure. So that's an important point. Growth Plan announced five specific initiatives, uh, the most relevant for this discussion, which are you know, energy uh, uh, retrofits, uh, zero electric buses, and uh, of course, clean power. Clean power includes generation, storage, and transmission. Transmission is especially important here in this country, um, uh, my fellow Canadians on the panel uh, will will know for with certainty, and many others may know. Canada is the second largest landmass in the world. It is a challenge to do anything, and we have sparsely inhabited communities that exist for good, valid, and historical reasons that we need as a people to support. So, I, I think fundamentally, we as a nation agree on that premise. The how is a little bit trickier. And, and so transmission up north is a challenge. Um, many of our indigenous communities use, rely on, on diesel uh, to create power. And so the unreliability and expense of that is something that we're working very hard um, uh, to do. And, and so we're working on a number of transmission projects that are high cost, uh, but that just take time because of the nature of the beast. The last point I'll make is really to explain how we engage with public and private partners. We have worked very hard in the last couple of years to collaborate and constructively engage with what we call here FPTMIs, federal, provincial, territorial, municipal, and indigenous groups to establish those relationships really with a view to understanding their priorities. And our view, uh, our role as an investor, we're not, a, we're not a procurement agency. We're not gonna 
create or uh, manufacture projects that we put out there. Our job is to enable and assist and advise on the priorities of those other groups we mentioned. So the way we do that is we engage with them at the highest levels in the, in the premier's offices, at, at, at the at the chiefs, uh, with the chiefs of the indigenous uh, communities, with mayors and, and the CAOs of municipalities and so on to establish their priorities. And indeed, we have a really re uh, recent, very good example of that. So the poster child for the success in how we're engaging is our announcement we made last Friday where we committed $407 million to irrigation upgrade in Alberta. That's an incredible project, 202,000 new acres of irrigated land with zero new water coming out of the source. So that's a, a real great exercise in efficient water management, good um, in a broad variety of ways. But that came about not because somebody in our office had a brilliant idea and said, you know what, nobody's talked about agriculture or irrigation. Why don't we do that? It came about because it became quickly apparent to us when we were talking to our partners that that was a key priority for the Western provinces. And so um, at the end of the day, you know, we listened and we acted. On the private debt side, I lead an investment team of 30 or so people, all of them from the private sector, from private equity, from uh, capital markets players, from investors, lenders. Uh, we keep those relationships uh, very warm and very close. You know, so, so we have a steady stream of available capital. Capital is not the issue for me. The, the leverage is a significant challenge. Uh, that seven to one you talked about overall is, you know, we will never see that on a, on a specific individual deal. And some sectors lend themselves to, you know, much lower leverage like broadband in a remote community as opposed to public transit in a large public transit project in a big urban center. So anyway, challenging, but um, all things that we're working on. And I will stop there in the interest of time, Diana. Thank you. We are running short of time. I just want to come back on one thing, John. We've had a number of questions throughout this discussion in the panel about Canada being behind, behind Europe, you know, being slow on the uptake. We've got, we have a decade to solve our problems. Our time is short. How can we, or how can you play a role in accelerating the pace? And, and relatedly, one of the huge pools of capital that's recognized globally is the Canadian pension plans. They are, they are discussed, you know, they are unique in many ways. Does that give you, what's your relationship with them and how are you able to uh, draw in that money into the kind of projects you're talking about? Yeah, no, great, great question. I mean, the relationships are very strong. They exist. We recognize their desire to want to invest in Canada. Uh, and and we recognize what their needs are. We need to set the circumstances, set the scene so they can invest in an appropriate way. And so, uh, honestly, you, you know, it, it, are we behind? Uh, I'll leave that for bigger brains than mine to answer. But what we view our role is in trying to close any gap that exists is actually getting projects on the street get them into implementation phases, get creative in advising the sponsors of the public sponsors of those projects as to how they can think about things differently, as to how they can make structural changes that would invite the big pension plans to come in and, and, and participate. And our role as an institution is to say, uh, is to identify the gap that exists in that project and, and, and come up with a way to fill that gap. I like to think of ourselves uh, you know, very colloquially as gap fillers. Let's identify what the gap is that preventing the, the, the additional investment from coming in. Let's find a way to fill that gap in a way that's, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 that is responsible and disciplined as an investor would be, but that brings them in. So to me, it's very simple. Let's, let's get deals done. If we get deals done, money will come. If we keep talking about getting deals done, uh, people will lose interest very quickly and find somewhere else to park their money. Thank you. I want to now quickly turn to the issue of transition. We've talked about green investments and on the, on, on the taxonomy, there's green and brown investments and it's very clear the criteria uh, to be in that green bucket. But there is also this big issue of transitioning out of where we are now and stuff that is not yet green and needs to become greener. And we've had a number of questions about financing oil and gas, financing um, LNG, etc. And there's a lot of disquiet about the transition issue. Sean, I know that you've worked quite a bit on that question. Perhaps you can give us shed some light on what you think needs to happen. Well, clearly, we need to transition our economies. I mean, we have economies that are still stuck in the oil and, oil and gas age, and they're now going to be in the clean age. We need that very, very quickly. That means taking companies that are currently invested in brown, 
shifting to the green, for example. It's going to be challenging in some areas, steel, cement, plastics, and so on. The challenge now is to identify a pathway, that's the transition, and to ensure we incentivize investments in achieving that pathway. That pathway has to be consistent with the Paris Climate Change Agreement. So let's be clear about that. When we're talking transition, we're not talking transition to some halfway house where it's a little bit better, but it's not fantastic. Everything, everything we do, mitigation, adaptation and resilience has to be in the context of what we have to do as a planet in the next 10 years to reduce emissions and to prepare for the climate change that is going to become a norm the bushfires in California and so on. These are future norms that we have to get used to. So, so that's the first part. But there's a huge amount to be done. I mean, we want oil companies to issue green bonds to finance renewables, for example. They're using a brown balance sheet to support green investments. I'm going to welcome Total or BP when they finally get around to do this. We want those companies to also have 2050 transition plans as we've seen recently, BP do a roadshow round, which are appropriately credible in the context of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. How do they meet that 55% cut in 10 years? Not 30 years, not 40 years. We do not have that sort of time. If a company does, we want to embrace them, welcome them in, and support them by doing transition bonds or other sorts of transition finance. It's a simple idea, Diana, right? It is simple, easier said than done, possibly. Jane, can I bring your, get your perspective on that transition issue and also come back to the question I posed to you about the, the difference between Canada and Europe? Sure, absolutely. Look, I mean, I completely uh, agree with, with what Sean said. And, you know, as I mentioned, we're active members of Climate Action 100 Plus and, and actually co-led the engagement with Total around some of their, their recent um, commitments. Uh, so it's not a kind of hard, you're in or you're out for us. We do have quite a strict coal policy. But, you know, in terms of other sectors and, and pieces of the economy, absolutely supporting transition and looking for the opportunities associated with that. In terms of, um, you know, the day-to-day -day reality of, of working for an asset management firm uh, or, or an asset owner, for that matter, in, in Canada versus Europe, big differences uh, in terms of the kind of regulatory requirements, which are both a catalyst, but also a burden from, from a data perspective, from a technology perspective, the requirements on us uh, that we're facing in a relatively short time period in terms of, of reporting include not only exposure against uh, the taxonomy, so green revenue, uh, which will be mandatory for asset owners and asset managers to you know, begin to report and will really allow apples to apples comparisons for, for end investors. There are also, as Sean mentioned, forthcoming requirements around adverse impacts these are still under discussion, but will include things like impacts of companies we invest in on um, species loss and biodiversity and different metrics, which are even more challenging than things like green revenue, which should be pretty straightforward once you have a taxonomy, as well as issues like human rights. So a, a big kind of effort there around measuring and reporting on adverse impacts. And then we also have our, our kind of French regulator overseeing us more directly. And uh, there's a big push in France to make sure that asset managers who are making commitments are really living up to those commitments, which is fantastic. But a lot of, you know, conversations around looking in detail at what different asset managers are doing around implementing things like our coal policy into the nitty gritty of, of which companies and why and what analysis have we done and where we're engaging with companies, you know, how is that going? Uh, so there is really, I think, a lot of onus both on kind of building the market, moving things forward, and really at the same time, you know, in a very relatively short time frame, pushing down in terms of those requirements and really kind of forcing firms to get their arms around this, uh, not just thinking about it conceptually, but kind of getting it into their data and reporting platforms in, in quite a, an accelerated pace. Thank you. I think what's Interesting, there was, a, there was a recent report out from RBC Capital Markets and it suggests that actually Canadian investors and European investors are similarly minded in terms of ESG. It's the US that is, is well back in terms of percentage points. So different regulatory structures, different, lots of different things, but at least uh, similar intentions. I want to circle that now, change the subject slightly and come back to Henna to talk about uh, the, this green bond uh, and sovereign issuing in the green bond space. Perhaps you can describe what Germany has done and if you have any views on uh, how that would translate to Canada, I'd be well, uh, love to hear them. Thank you very much, Diana. 
Well, it, it was uh, in early September this year when the uh, German debt management officers for the very first time issued a green bond. And it was a 10-year bond uh, and had a volume of 6.5 billion, but uh, this issuance was met by bids for of more than 30 billion. So there was a very huge demand. And in early September, uh, the Ministry of Finance will issue a second one, a five-year term bond. And then at the end of the year, we will have an outstanding volume of green bonds of roughly 11 billion at the end of this year. So, but, it's worth mentioning uh, that Germany was by far not the front runner in issuing green sovereigns. Uh, here, other countries, our neighbor countries, were much earlier to bring a green sovereign to the market. Uh, but what is new uh, now when it comes to the German way of issuing is that they, we set up a, an innovation, a concept called the twin bond concept. That means Whenever uh, this means that each green German sovereign is linked to an already existing conventional bond with identical features concerning coupon structures and maturity, and the holder of a green German sovereign can switch into a conventional bond if they like to. Because when the Ministry of Finance or the German Debt Management Office is issuing, let's say, 10 billion of green sovereigns, then the debt management offers, uh, office at the same time will tap a conventional twin and will take it on their own books. So you can change through the debt management office your green bond, if you like, into a conventional one. Why was this kind of innovation necessary? Uh, the, the idea behind that was that uh, the, the, the German bunds are, and the yield curve, so to say, is the benchmark for Euroland. And it's essential if you have to and want to preserve a benchmark, you have to preserve liquidity in your assets. And the German uh, uh, outstanding debt is by far not the biggest one in Europe. There are other countries who have higher volumes of outstanding uh, public debt than Germany. But how to preserve the liquidity in a benchmark product if you start splitting your debt in conventional and green? And that was the challenge. And uh, how to, so to say, convince the investors that the green bond is always liquid because I can switch it into a conventional bond uh, if, if I like to. So this was uh, very well perceived by the market. And uh, there's also another difference uh, because the, the federal government is going to build a green curve over the entire maturity range from two years to 30 years. So at the end, there will be a conventional bund curve and a green bund curve at the same time. That is the idea. And, and that would be the first time that we really have a complete curve, maybe in a, in a few years, in green sovereigns. That is, so to say, the challenge for now for the debt management office. Uh, there was so much more uh, we could have said, uh, and lots and lots of questions. I appreciate all the participation. Uh, we will capture all the questions and we will share the recording. One of the issues that we didn't really talk about, and I hope we will come back to, is financing the building retrofit revolution. That is going to be the fifth in, uh, in this series. And I know Sabrina and the KFW have a lot of expertise, so hopefully we'll be able to bring you back and, and tap you for that knowledge then. In the meantime, we have uh, our next event is on carbon fiber. Um, so do join us in two weeks time. Thank you again to the German ambassador for introducing the session and for sponsoring this, this learning between uh, Europe and Canada. Uh, and thanks uh, to all the panelists. I'm sorry that we didn't, uh, we weren't able to uh, draw out a few more of your infinite knowledge on these topics, um, but let's move together uh, to raise more money and make the recovery a greener one, build forward better as Sabrina said. Thanks to everyone, goodbye.